evening. I'm so glad you guys could join us tonight for the second annual Grant High School Story Slam. We have um, Andrew Dixon, and I met Andrew when the Moth Story Hour came to Grant two years ago, and they brought him in to be the MC of that Story Hour, and it was so much fun. I really tried to have him be here last year, but his schedule just couldn't accommodate it. Um, so this year he said yes, he could be here, and I'm really delighted to bring up Andrew Dixon. How's everyone doing tonight? Yeah, we doing good? You guys excited to hear some stories? Yeah. Oh, I am, for sure. Uh, I am so excited to be here, to be back on the Grant Library stage. It's gotten a little taller since I was last here, which I appreciate, because I always need a couple extra inches. Uh, and Paige asked if I would sort of start with a sacrificial first story, just to sort of set the bar right about here, not too high, not too low. Um, so I thought I would do that. Uh, and so I've been thinking about our theme tonight, which is departures. So uh, the stars of our show, of course, are the students who have volunteered and have been working with Paige to, uh, to sharpen and hone their stories, all on the theme of departures. Uh, so I've been thinking about um, when I decided to move here to Portland which was way back in 1995, which is before half of you were born, which makes me feel really old, because I guess I am old, which is a weird thing to kind of come to terms with in front of a lot of people. But there it is. I'm old now. Uh, so I grew up in Washington, D.C., which, are you guys, you guys been? Maybe a little school trip? It's, it's all right, it's, you know. It's, uh, it's great, but it's not a lot of fun. D.C., not a, it's not a lot of fun. I remember in, uh, in when I was in college, there was, a, there was an article in the equivalent of the Willamette Week about this really cool pool hall that like all the cool people were hanging out in. So my friends and I went, and we were the only guys not wearing ties. You know, it's about, it's about appearances, it's about working hard, it's about who you work for, who you're lobbying for. And I'm kind of more what they call a creative type. Are we got any creative types in the room? Right, so I wanted to come somewhere, you know, I wanted to go somewhere new, and I wanted to sort of start the next chapter and, Try something different. Um, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, I liked the idea of being a rock star. I played the drums, but I wasn't that good. So that was, that was feeling iffy. Um, and I wanted to be a filmmaker. Um, hello. Which I was okay at. Uh, yeah, we're good, we're good. Um, but you know, that's a hard job to get. You can't exactly apply to be the next Steven Spielberg. You kind of have to put, you know, years of hard work in to get there. So I, um, I just said, well, I, I don't know. I guess I got to figure out where I'm going to go first. Where am I going to live? And ever, all my friends who are also creative types were all going to New York or San Francisco or Los Angeles because, you know, these were creative capitals. Uh, and, you know, there's exciting things happening there and there's opportunities and there's jobs and they're expensive. And I said, gosh, I don't want a job. And if I moved there, I'd have to get one because they're all expensive places to live. So I just, I thought, like, I've heard of this place, Portland, Oregon, and it's supposed to be affordable. And I'd seen Van Sant movies, and I hadn't visited, but it looked kind of cool from, you know, from the movies. So I said, all right, I'll, that's what I'll do. I, so I had a plan. I was going to go to Portland. Didn't know what I was going to do. Didn't know, you know, what, what uh, life, would, life would take me once I got here. But first, I had to make some money. So I had to move back in with my parents, and I worked three jobs. I worked three jobs. I kept a ledger of how much I made, how much I spent, because I wanted to get out to Portland as quick as possible. So I was a pizza delivery driver, because of course, right? That's a good, good job for, for the youth. Uh, I was uh, an inventory specialist, which sounds really fancy. Basically, we, about 50 of us would wait for the office depot to close, and then we would just spread out like an army. And we would each be given like three aisles. I was on staplers, you know, and be like, all right, red staplers, scan, count four, you know, and we had a little pocket computer, four red staplers, all right, yellow staplers, six yellow staplers. And we would do that until we had counted every single thing of every single thing in the entire store until the wee hours of the night. That was fun, minimum wage. And then I was a temp. Have you guys ever tempt? You know what being a temp is? It's basically, it's, it's like being a substitute teacher but instead of getting a call at 6 a.m. saying, you know, Miss Johnson's sick, uh, do you want to teach her algebra class? They've just got some random job. So they'll call you at 6 in the morning and be like, there's a law office. There's a lot of paperwork that needs to be filed. Do you want to spend the next three days filing all that paperwork? And you say, yes, <laughs> that sounds great. Uh, so I worked and I worked and worked. And I finally I made enough money to move out here. 
And I made the same mistake that everybody moves, that everyone makes when they move to Portland. Take a guess. When did you think I moved here? I came in 95, but great, great, I came in September. Everyone does it. You come, you come in September. So I had this amazing cross-country trip, and I saw America for the first time, and it was beautiful, and it was sunny, and the roads weren't too crowded because it was, you know, kids were back in school. And I get here, and I just I remember driving through the gorge and I-84, and I, of course, you got to, you know, you can't just cut over to Grant. You got to, you know, you got to go downtown, and you see the sun glinting off big pink. I was like, this is where I'm going to live, and it was beautiful. And then the next day, it started raining. And it rained for seven months. And you know what happens when it starts raining? We all go inside, right? And we start working on our projects. And we're reading and writing. And we're hanging out with the people we know. And if you're new to town and you don't know anyone, you don't meet anyone, right? So I was miserable. And I started running out of money. So I had to get a job. So of course, I turned to my old favorite, temping. And I ended up, uh, I ended up you know, Yeon? You guys ever go out to Savi's Island? So you know, you go on along Yeon, and there's all these warehouses. And in one of them, is every single pair of Doc Martin shoes that anyone will wear in America. Now, they're made in London. They could ship them by boat to Boston or Baltimore, because if we can see our geog geographic map, that would make sense. No, no, no. They send them all the way down to South America through the Suez Canal, up the West Coast. Oh, I'm going too long. All right, so I was there. It was terrible. It was just, it was, it was, you know, it was terrible. And I almost moved home. But you know what I did? I stuck it out. I stayed here, and it stopped raining come spring, and I started meeting people, and I started collaborating with people, and I met people who made movies and wanted to play music, and I ended up living in a warehouse, and then I got into the film industry, and I was working on movies, and I ended up starting to perform, and then I ended up at Wyden and Kennedy at the big ad agency downtown writing TV commercials for Old Spice, and I got involved in The Moth and doing all these amazing things, and so it worked out, right? And I share that with you, and especially those of you who were not around back in 1995, because you all, I'm talking to you, you storytellers especially, will be taking a departure from your current lives when you graduate from high school, off to college, off to a new place, maybe just not living with your parents, which is departure enough into a new world. And if I was your guidance counselor, I know, that's usually, see, I'm the host. I don't have these rules. They, they usually don't apply to me, but I'm going to wrap it up. I'm going to wrap it up. So conventional wisdom says you have to have a plan, right? And if I was your graduate, uh, your guidance counselor, I would say, you know, there, you guys, you got to have a goal. You got to know what you're going to do. You got to have your five-year plan. And if you're that kind of person, great. Absolutely. Go with it. Come up with your plan. But I, I'm here to say if you don't know what you want to do and haven't figured it out, trust your gut. And go. And be open to meeting new people and be open to new opportunities and it can work out. There it is. There's my story. Overtime. We're not even going to see what they have. Five. Oh, gosh. With a little, with a little life lesson wrapped in. All right. So we, ladies and gentlemen, are going to hear from our seven student storytellers. Um, they, as, and I think we've gotten a good example, uh, a good demonstration of how it's going to work. Uh, we are looking for six-minute stories maximum. Uh, at the five-minute mark, they will be getting the wand uh, waved in their direction. And that's okay, but you notice when that happened to me, I sped up, and I got through the next 22 years in about 45 seconds. I still went over time. Uh, a minute, yeah, a minute and a half. Okay. So uh, at the at the six minute mark, they're going to get one of those, and that at that point, ladies and gentlemen, the scores will be affected because we do have our panel of judges, and they will be sharing their score uh, after each storyteller, and we're all winners, except maybe not me because I went seven and a half minutes apparently. Uh, but one will be one, one of us will be a little more winner than the rest, and they will go home with some sort of prize, I'm sure, uh, and the honor and glory. Um, so I think one I want to before we get into our first story, I do want to talk a little bit about storytelling. Has anyone? Uh, do we have some big story fans? Have you guys been to a storytelling event or maybe listened to uh, a podcast and that kind of thing? All right, great. Is anyone new? Has anyone never really been to a storytelling event before? That's, that's great. That's good, too. I mean, you've heard stories, right? But this is new. This is the idea of, of someone getting on stage and, uh, and, and, and not having any props, not having a script, not having any notes, uh, just sort of sharing their story with us. Uh, and it's, I think it's a, really, it's a really magical kind of art. Uh, and I've been lucky enough. I've been doing it for about four years, and I've hosted like 50 of these at high schools and in theaters all over town. And I've always thought it was really cool. 
and really fun and really rewarding. Uh, but I got to say, over the last couple months, my relationship to storytelling has changed. And I think, you know, we're living in time where uh, there's a lot of, there's, we're, we're, we're getting bombarded with real news and with fake news and we're being told one is the other and the other is not. And uh, I think, I think the, the very act of us being here together and honoring and listening to these true stories that these students are gonna come up here and share with us is a really important act. Uh, so I'm really proud that they volunteered to do this and to share their truth with us. And the fact that we're here to listen and to bear witness, and when they're done, we're not gonna say, actually, I, just, I don't think that's how it happened. We're gonna clap and whoop and maybe holler a little bit, right? Absolutely. Uh, and then finally, I just think, you know, look, we got our screens put away. We're not on them. We're not doing this. And we're not trying to communicate through them. We're all here in one place. Let's give ourselves a round of applause for being here. Yeah. All right. Absolutely. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, are you guys ready for your first storyteller? When I announce his name, I want you, I want you guys to make him feel so loved and so excited to be up here. Ladies and gentlemen, put it... Put your hands together for Tayo Mosler. Get on up here, Tayo! There we go. How's that? Uh, quite the entrance speech. Um, so, you know, I don't really know how to start this one because I'm not sure if this story is excruciating. I don't know if it's... I don't really know how to describe it, but it was definitely the most frantic, uh, the most frantic departure of my life. So, think of this. You're 16, maybe si you're 15, 16 years old, uh, and you're in Japan um, on, a, on a trip called the Sapporo Summer Institute uh, with the Japanese Magnet Program. Um, and it's just an incredible time. Uh, you spend an entire month there, all without chaperones. It's just you going around uh, Japan and trying to figure out what you're going to do. So, um, we were given an itinerary from the Japanese government to tell us what we needed to do, where we needed to be, uh, which included a six-hour layover in Tokyo's Narita Airport. Um, and, you know, so, you're 16, what, what are you going to do? You're stuck in an airport for six hours with your friends, like five or six of them, and there's a mall. You go shopping. I had a 60-pound bag, and I was still trying to shove the last little bits in, but I still made do. So we started to get tired and decided to go sit down at a charge station, charge up our electronics and whatnot, do that. Uh, me and my buddy Killian uh, decided to grab our bags and uh, check them early because that's the kind of people we were. According to the list, we were about four hours ahead of schedule. So we go grab our tickets. We're going along, just walking, walking. And I look at my passport. K Killian? Killian. Are these our tickets? And, uh, you know, I don't want to uh, burn anyone's ears with what we may have said, but uh, it was the expletive for fecal matter. Um, before we just started sprinting, we just gunned it over to check, got our bags in, and then sprinted, me with my 60 pound rock on my back, running to uh, get over to the charge table, let our buddies know what was going on. And, you know, you may notice on your list, I'm called the uh, resident shepherd. Um, because immediately after that, I turned and I began running because we still had people out in the mall. And we had 20 minutes to make it to our gate, through security, through customs, to our gate. So I sprinted, backpack and all, just going and I found a couple of people first, sent them back, found more, sent them back, and there was just one person left looking around. So I, I probably circled that place five times just trying to find this person. And I'm circling, I'm circling, I'm circling, can't find anything. So I come back, I look at the charge station, no one's there. I look over and I see Killian again running towards me, so I sprint over to him, huffing and puffing because I'd been, again, running up and down stairs just trying to find where everybody was. And turns out that the gal had come back. We'd found her. And uh, I'd left my phone behind because, you know, being the person I am, I just sprinted off with, without my phone so I couldn't communicate. Um, we ended up uh, 
getting to the security gate, waiting for the gal to check her bags. She's checking them in, and then for what felt like 15 minutes, she's sitting there debating with the <laughs> with the luggage attendant uh, on a second bag that she could possibly check. So we're just, the, the minutes are ticking down. We're down to about 20 minutes before we're supposed to be on the plane. And we luckily make it through, uh, but we still have probably 100 yards, maybe more, to just sprint, all out sprint, because we're under a minute before our plane's final boarding calls. So we get there. We're huffing and puffing. Everyone's there. We're just, it's the best feeling. We made it on time until the PA system sounds. Your flight has been delayed for five minutes. Thank you. Give it up for Tayo, kicking off the Grant Story Slam. A frenetic, frantic story about getting there under time, and he was under time. We didn't hear it, we didn't, we didn't hear the, the magic wand even once. Even once, and I love, they're so punctual. Like, in, in America, they're like, ah, it's been 15 minutes, should we tell people they're, the plane's late? Ah. It's a little, we'll wait till 25, until enough people, five minutes, they told you five minutes. Very precise. Yeah, very good. All right, one more time. Give it up for Tayo. Ah. How are we doing, judges? We we ready to do this? I think we could do it all one, one at a time, but I think we're going to do it all at once. So they can't be affected by each other, right? So on, on the count of three, let's see the scores. One, two, three. There it is, destroying the 5.6 I got. Tayo, a full two points higher. Wonderful. Thank you, Judge. Is our math department, have you had time to copy down the scores? I like it. They're over here. They're over there. But they're working together face to face without screens. <laughs> out, in the, uh, out, in the, out in the parking lot, of course. All right, ladies and gentlemen, your second storyteller of the eve. Please go nuts for David Hamblin. Get on up here. So, unlike Tayo, I can honestly say that this departure was the most excruciatingly painful one of my life. Uh, I've never broken a bone before, and this is the story of how I broke this baby right here. They said no props, but I don't think this counts. <laughs> so, um, yeah, a little bit of backstory. Um, my name is David Hamblin. I'm an 11-time national gold medalist in roller figure sk skating. It's like what you see the ice skaters do at the Olympics, but on roller. Um, yeah, I practice intensively, go four, maybe five days a week. Uh, my entire family does it. Um, yeah, and so it was just a regular day um, with my cousin. Usually we go in, do homework. Nothing was really different except my mom had actually gotten a part-time job. She already worked as a skating instructor, but decided that to bring in a little extra income that she'd also participate as the assistant in the, in the main office where my aunt also worked. So um, with taking that little liberty and freedom into my hands, I decided to make the bold choice not to study for my biology tests the next day. And I slapped on my skates where there were actually people out on the floor. Um, this hardly happened because it was a 3.30 to 5.30 session uh, in the afternoon with barely any people most of the time. But today was for some reason different. So... Um, I go out with a friend named Thomas, and we throw down the slalom cones. And we, those are cones that you weave in and out of, and I decide to get one lap going as fast as I can and weave in and out of them as fast as I can, and that is not when I fell. So I'm a little tired out after this. I go into the snack bar, maybe grab a drink. Uh, I come back out onto the floor going the opposite direction from the rest of the general public. Um, not my smartest choice. But I made it to the middle safely. That is not when I fell. So for my third time, uh, for my third, I guess, try at getting hurt, um, <laughs> I go the opposite direction of everyone else on the slalom cones, um, and I make it out alive. No, no pain. Uh, that is not when I fell. But I roll on two feet for about five feet, not really doing anything at all, just two feet, all eight wheels on the floor, when I suddenly lose my balance. I hear my friend Thomas calling out to me, David, David, 
as I fall back, my arms go out behind me as they have many times before, but this time something was different. I must have landed wrong. There must have been a little more extra something there, but I hear a sharp crack and a loud pop, and the throbbing just starts in my arm, goes up through my elbow, through my shoulder, and into my heart, which gives back its own pulsating pain. Every single heartbeat contributing to that agony. But I just lay there, and I can't think of anything except for one phrase. My buddy looks down at me, and he goes, David, you okay? You can't lay there like that. I just look up at him, and I go, Thomas, I broke my arm. Thomas, I broke my arm, I broke my arm, I broke my arm. I can't think of anything. Um, I stand up, skate over to the skate shop, cradling my injured arm, and I roll up to the lady on duty, Jules, one of my coworkers, and I say, Jules, I broke my arm, I broke my arm, I broke my arm. I wasn't doing anything, but I broke my arm. She takes one look at it and goes, yeah, that's a broken arm. So she runs and gets uh, her manager, my manager, um, who's on duty, Becky. She, not, not many of you might know this, but they actually keep uh, on duty, they keep um, splints, cardboard splints. And she grabs me one of those, she ties it up, um, puts an ice bag in there. Everything's feeling nice and secure, except for the one thing that had me questioning the stability of it. They tied it not with any kind of a rope or anything around my shoulder to keep it from moving. They tied it with a skate lace. <laughs> a skate lace from a roller skate that was probably as old as I am. <laughs> so um, they call my mom down from the office. Um, the one time she wasn't there, my cousin comes up and all I can think about is I broke my arm, I broke my arm, I broke my arm. It was definitely true. Um, and as they wheelchaired me out to my mom's car so that she could drive me from the hospital or to the hospital, I was not only departing from the rink to the hospital, I was also departing from my skates off of them for at least a solid month. I'm two years into my sentence and I, I'm two month, or two weeks, there we go. <laughs> I can get my time down, I promise. Sorry. But <laughs> and, um, I'm two weeks into my sentence. I have two weeks left until I can skate again. Um, and I really can't wait to get back on them. Thank you. Give it up for David. <laughs> Woo! Was, was this at Oaks Park? Oaks Park, I was just there Saturday. <laughs> what time? <laughs> I bought a pretzel from you. Right at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah, we were there for Penny's party. Yeah, she was one of the... F yeah, well, oh, w when you do. Wow. There was about 14 happening at once. Yeah. Uh, and sure enough, so that must happen a lot because so what we, it was, the party was from 2 to 5. I get there about 2.20. There's, ar there's already a broken wrist. <laughs> Compound fracture. Penny's grandma. It was terrible. Um but I mean, is that like a daily occurrence or an hourly occurrence or, or exactly. once in a... No, exactly. Oh. It's, it kind of comes in waves. It'll like not happen for a while and then all at once, boom, boom, boom. Right, right. So, fun, so I've, only, I've actually only been there twice. Once was on Saturday and once was like seven days after I moved here back in 1995. And we went and it was, uh, it was like a Sunday night. And, you know, I went with a bunch of friends and acquaintances and we were all stumbling around and it was amazing. And, and then they'd be like, all right, backwards only. And we'd all stumble off. And there were these couples in their 60s and 70s with matching skate outfits that were just doing amazing tricks. And actually, I was, I was telling this story to someone uh, Saturday at, at while well, you were in the snack bar. And this woman turns to me. She says, still happens. Got to be here on Wednesday and Sunday nights. So are you there when, when, when these couples come out in their matching outfits and... Who's who's your favorite? Do you have a favorite couple? Um, let's see, it's gotta be. <laughs> Hold on, there's a chance to get a couple. Um, Mary Lou and Bo. Do they have like one outfit, or does it? Uh, do they have a, a whole wardrobe of different skating outfits? Okay, it's a wardrobe. <laughs> Good to know. I guess you go skating a lot. You know, you gotta you gotta switch it up a little bit. 
All right, let's see what the judges have in store for David. I broke my arm, I broke my arm, I broke my arm. There it is, the scores from the judges. Lots of consistency. Very exciting. We will give our math department a chance to scribe all of those down. How we feel in math department? All right. Well, that brings us to Sarah Mellinger. Give it up for Sarah. <laughs> Woo! Get on up here, Sarah. Yes. How's that feel? You're going to be great. It's going to be Thank great. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, so last summer, my mother decided that my sister and I needed to bond with her boyfriend's two children. Um, that would be absolutely great. I, I really love them. But the way she decided to do this was through camping. Um, I'm not a nature person. I hate camping. It's bad. <laughs> um, so I was having a meltdown on the floor like a five-year-old would have been embarrassed for me. And my mom squat downs and she goes, Sarah, get your butt off the floor. If you promise to pretend you're happy on this camping trip, I promise I will never make you go again. So reluctantly, I pry myself off the floor, go and pack. No flares. I had been told that when you're five minutes from civilization, you don't need them. Um, but I did bring tie-dye shirts because I didn't want to ruin my normal ones. Um, the second I got to the campground, I realized that had been a terrible mistake. Their bright pink color attracted like a million bugs onto my thing and they were so small that you had to kill them by like pressing the back of your fingernail onto them so i'd like try and scrape oops <laughs> scrape the dead bug carcasses off my arms but i'd move around and i could feel them there <laughs> um so that was strike one of my camping trip um, luckily, I didn't have to be in the dead bug shirts for that long because we had been told there was a hot springs at the campground, which was around a lake, East Lake Campground. Um, so we're in our bathing suits and our towels and we're like, yay, hot spring. But we walk up to the thing and the waves are yellow. There are bugs like skimming the surface of the water and it smells like rotten eggs. The person, wa the person walking with us goes, oh yeah, they have sulfur in this lake. Um, they weren't daunted, but when we got to the hot spring, it was like three feet deep max. There was poop like around it. Uh, bugs, bugs are still there. It still smelled like sulfur. We turned around real quick <laughs> and got milkshakes at the nearby place where, you know, civilization was. <laughs> Strike two. Um, so I'm trying to collect myself. Maybe camping isn't all that bad. And I walk down the pier of the lake, and it, it really is gorgeous. I mean, if you're there, don't go to the hot springs, just go down the pier, um, all the mountains. It's very pretty. Uh, my mom's boyfriend and her two children were fishing, and they caught a fish. I was like, yay, a fish. <laughs> um, and they were going to release it because we weren't going to eat it. But these two preteen boys run down the pier and like, wait. We're going to eat that. <laughs> they didn't know what they were doing. <laughs> so we gave them the fish, because, I mean, why not? Um, and they look at the fish, and they look at us, and they look at the fish for five solid minutes. <laughs> when finally they throw the fish on the floor and go, on their head, they crush it. Fish and guts and blood go everywhere. <laughs> But the fish did not die. <laughs> so what do they do? They stomp on it again. <laughs> it really is dead, but it's also inedible. <laughs> um, finally, they brush the dead mush off the pier with their foot. But that was strike three. I was out of patience for camping. <laughs> I got back to the campground and I was crying like, they killed a fish. <laughs> On the way back, I was crying too, the departure back. 
I was crying too, but they were tears of joy. <laughs> I had a smile on my face so big it hurt. And I looked around, I was like, I am never coming back. <laughs> Thank you. Give it up for Sarah. Oh, a little bit more love. There we go. There we go. Oh, you did great. And have you been camping since? No. <laughs> Emphatically. She is not a nature person. I also I like the, the good foreshadowing in the hot springs. I think we knew something was, was going to go wrong with that hot springs with those air quotes. Air quotes, one of the, they're not a prop, a very powerful tool of the storyteller, the air quotes. Right, all right. Did you hear that? Air quotes. Very, very powerful tool of the storyteller. All right, speaking of the judges, let's see what they have in store for Sarah. There they are, dead fish and all. <laughs> Woo! Very nice. These, I can, the, our math wizards are going to have to work overtime. This is, this is going to be a barn burner, I can tell. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, up next, Jamie Fields. Give it up. Give it up for Jamie. Good? Okay. Okay. So, for most people, departure automatically has a negative connotation because it means you're leaving something behind and you're probably not coming back. But sometimes departure can be good for you, and so I'm going to talk about how departing my comfort zone has ultimately changed me for the better. And so I departed my comfort zone by being a part of the JMP, like Tayo. So I <laughs> started in the JMP in kindergarten. I was put there. I didn't really have a choice in it. And so over the years, I went through the program, the Japanese immersion program, and I got slowly better at Japanese. And then my first real departure from my comfort zone came in eighth grade when we had a two-week trip to Japan. So the thing about this trip was that not only were we going to a foreign country, but we would have to do a project. And so I had to walk around Japan with my friend, but no adults, and we had to stop and interview 70 different people in a language that we were not comfortable with about their opinions on gender roles in society, which, <laughs> believe it or not, is not a comfortable topic for most people. <laughs> but we went there, we got the interviews, we had fun, we came back, and then I was like, okay, I'm going to keep with the program, I'm going to go to Grant, because that's what my friends were doing, so why not? And so I went in, I had a pretty good ninth grade year, and then, towards the end of the year, my teacher came up to me, and she's like, so, um, the normal JMP class is going to be pretty full next year, so how about we move you to the advanced class? And so the thing about the advanced class is that all the kids in there had scored really super high on this test we had to take in eighth grade that measured your Japanese ability, where I was, like, average, which is okay, but, uh, eh, it was average. And so I was, when I first heard this, I was like, okay, um, no, I, I would mind moving. This is terrifying. But then my second reaction was, wait, okay, if I don't do this, I'm going to regret this forever. Screw it, screw it, yes, sure, whatever. I'll, I'll move. And so then I came into the year, and I'm terrified because half the students in the class are, like, fluent. They have Japanese parents. They t speak it all the time at home. Like, they're fluent. And the other half of the kids are just really super smart, and they study all the time. And, uh, yeah, I can't. And so I get into class, I'm doing okay, I, I scrape an A my first quarter, but then the second quarter, like, I'm right at, at midpoint, I'm like 90.4, and like, I'm a straight A student, and I didn't want to wreck my GPA, and the finals were coming up, and I was terrified, because it's like the hardest test, it's the big test, and so I got up super early the day of the final, I studied for an hour in the library beforehand, I go in, and I look at the page of questions, and I'm like, shoot, this is vocabulary, and I know none of it. And I turn to the next page, I look at the first question, I don't know that either. Second question, no. Third question, I'm like, wait. I think I recognize that from the reading. So I turn back to the reading that she gave us along with the test. I'm like, okay, I can do this. And I fly through the questions. I go back and answer the first two, guess all the vocabulary, because who really cares? And then I have, <laughs> and then I, sorry, sensei. And then I have <laughs> 45 minutes to write an essay on my opinion, on traditional versus newer sports. And I know nothing about sports, honestly. So I started freaking out. I'm like, I can't do this. I can't do this. No, I'm okay. I can do this. So I, I write out an outline. I do a five-paragraph essay. 
and I'm feeling okay. And then a second I turn it on, I start freaking out and checking my grade. Like, I don't even give her time to, like, look at my test before I start checking my grades. I go to her after school, and I'm like, ah. And she's like, there's nothing you can do about it now. And she sat me down and gave me a 10-minute pep talk on why it's okay to fail the final and get a B, (laughs) which did not make me feel good about myself. (laughs) But so I kept checking my grades and checking my grades. And then finally... I checked my grades, and I got a B on the final, but since I got an A on another project, I was able to scrape an A overall in the class, which was like, yes. Okay, I'm not going to ruin my GPA. And so, but now I'm getting comfortable again, which is, which is okay, but it's not making me a better person. So this, this summer, I'm going to do the Sapporo Summer Institute, which means I'll be going for, to Japan for a month alone. I'll be split up from my friends. There won't be any adults with us. And... I am honestly terrified. This will be my third big departure, but, you know, I think I can do it, and I think it'll make me a better person. So, as we would say in Japanese class, kite kurete arigatou gozaimashita. Keep it going for Jamie! Yeah! Wow! I'm it. So... So I have this straight. In eighth grade, you went to Japan and interviewed 70 people on the street <laughs> about gender roles in society. I, currently, I would not like to go to Portland and interview seven people in English about anything. We did America, Japan, and Japan. What was even more uncomfortable than the other? Let's hope they know what they're doing down there in Silicon Valley, or all the research is off. Well, well done, Jamie. Well done. And I am so, I'm so proud of you for taking that. I, you know, uh, what I love about stories is when we hear about someone else's experience, they often make us reflect on our own. And you talked about you know, that sort of decision of whether or not to take the advanced or not. And I, I suddenly, I flashed to, I actually, tra- I, did, I went to a regular college, but I wanted to see what an art college was like. So I, so I transferred in, knowing full well I wasn't going to stay there for very long, and uh, and I remember I signed up for this art class, this painting class. And I remember going, and you know, it was all the super experienced seniors and juniors who were painters. And I was a junior too, but I, I hadn't really gone to art school, and I didn't know you were supposed to bring your paints. So, <laughs> so everyone just starts. He gives us some. He was. It was the, I remember the assignment. It was paint an, a self portrait on the inside out. And I was like, what the? What does that even mean? I don't have my paints, and they're all painting. And I and I and I chickened out. And I dropped it. And I regret it. So good on you for, for taking that class. All right. Let's see what the judges have in store for Jamie. There it is. Hold him up high. There we go. Very nice. Oh, let's get a little bit more. One more time for the judges. Let's hold him up high for the, mass, for the math wizards to make sure they've got them all. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, Aiden Hefner, get on up here, Aiden! Woo! There we go. How's that feel? That feels great. You told me I could before I got up here. I mean, I can't do this without him, so I'll have to get marked down for it, but that's fine with me. Um, sorry, guys, I'm a little sick tonight, but uh, so is my story. <laughs> so, uh, I went to Burning Man when I was eight years old, and uh, that might make some of you laugh. That might make some of you concerned for me, but um, I'll tell you what that means if you have no opinion on it. Um, People go to Burning Man because they want to watch a giant wooden man burn. They want to try experimental drugs made in coffee cans and old boots. Or uh, they want to take in the amazing view, and that's not the old desert plain at the bottom of Nevada. That's the sea of naked people that flock there and have themselves a good time. Um, the more clothes you wear, the less you belong. So uh, I road tripped there with my brother and my dad. And, you know, it's hard for an 8-year-old and an 11-year-old to sit still and be calm in a 10-hour ride. So the drive kind of sucked. But that was the day I learned how to pee in a bottle. Um, so it wasn't all bad. So uh, we get there at night, and we give our tickets to the lady. And we, then we uh, head to my dad's friend's camp. And we uh, set up our stuff. And uh, I just want to point out that we're missing a horrifying amount of school just uh, 
Go see dust storms, free glow sticks, and naked Santa. <laughs> naked Santa. That was uh, head to waist in your traditional Santa outfit, you know, nothing else on the rest. And he was giving out free snow cones. Now, to the average nine-year-old, that might be a cause for alarm, but I was irresponsible. So uh, all I saw was a potential snow cone. I met the man, I got the snow cone, and I left. I guess the moral is take risks. I don't know. Uh, but nighttime in Burning Man is really where a child has the most fun, because uh, in the main commons area, there is like this big open space where everybody can drive these floats around that they spend months working on. And it's kind of amazing, because there are pirate ships, and there are, I don't know, whatever your imagination can come up with. It's, it's at Burning Man, and it's in the form of a float. Uh, we we had a great time with this one uh, that was all dressed up as a pirate ship, and they took us aboard, and they let my brother and I drive it around. They gave us free free pizza, and it was kind of amazing. Everything in Burning Man is free. There's kind of a sense of you give everything you have, and then you take a little from everyone else. Um, but what you should not expect is uh, to come back to your camp and find a crackhead dressed as a dinosaur raiding your stuff, stealing hammocks and beer from your friend's camp. You know, things happen. Um, I'll finish it up by saying when we finally departed from Nevada, it felt like leaving another dimension where everything is 10 degrees hotter and 90% dustier. Thank you very much. A little bit more for Aiden. <laughs> Woo! Well, I gotta ask. I mean, are there like a lot of other eight-year-olds and eleven-year-olds? You know, there are, and it's very uncomfortable. Like, because there's a certain amount of communication. Like, you lock eye contact with another kid, and you're like, "Yeah, we're both right here." <laughs> yeah, there's no like, "We're here." It's like, "We're here, and we gotta get used to it." How, how long were you there for? Just just a week. <laughs> just a week. <laughs> yeah, and have you been back? I haven't, but... Will you ever go back? All right, right. Next year's Naked Santa, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. All right, let's see what the judges have in store for Aiden. There it is. The scores for Aiden. All right, ladies and gentlemen... Our penultimate storyteller, Alora Holbeck, get on up here, Alora. I think that's tall enough. Okay, so before I start my story, I just want to say that the day after David broke his arm, he did in fact pass the biology test that he was not studying for. Okay, now I can continue with my story. So I am telling a story that I had not originally intended on telling tonight, but it is more relevant and recent to my life. So um, when I was in kindergarten, I was also put into the Japanese magnet program, as well as Jamie and Tayo. I'm sorry, you have to live through another Japanese story. Um, um, I was put in a story, this program, sorry, excuse me. And um, I went through it from my from kindergarten right after I had moved from Texas. I had like this moved here from Texas, I had this, like, um, southern drawl that I got made fun of for, but, I mean, I was, like, the coolest six-year-old you've ever met, you know? I had a southern drawl in Portland um, as a six-year-old, and I went through this program, and in kindergarten and in first grade, homework was an option. I didn't do my homework. Um, when I got to second grade, I didn't want to do my homework. I was lazy. I had I didn't have the habit. I didn't do my homework. I started failing Japanese from second grade. And I failed Japanese until seventh grade. I failed Japanese for a really, really long time. I was in a bad place. I didn't I couldn't do it. I I understood like every couple words maybe the teacher was saying, like really like every ten words. Um I w barely made my way. I don't know how I did it after that. I um, came to eighth grade, and I had some really supportive teachers, and I, I kind of got out of, like, this bad vibe that I had been giving. And um, I started passing Japanese magically after failing since second grade. I um, I had to. I was. I also went to Japan. I had to do I had to pass Japanese to be able to go to Japan. Um, I passed my 
um, my tests to get me to come to Grant, I did not take a Japanese immersion class the first year that I came here. I took the Kiso 5-6 class, which is the elective classes. Um, I came here and I passed that class and I, um, I passed last semester barely by half a percent just when I was failing. I failed. Um, I worked really hard. I, I had my grade up, grade up to a C and then I failed my final. I failed my final and I got down to a D by half a percent and my straight A student Jamie helped me bring up that half percent to a C and I passed it and I passed it and I went through this thing with my mom where we both kind of freaked out because for me my life has always taken departures and and I've always been changing and I went from I've had family members leave and I've had I've moved houses a lot I moved from Oregon I moved to Oregon from Texas when I was five and um, I my home life felt like everything was changing all the time 100% of the time and I couldn't handle not leaving I couldn't handle not leaving JMP because JMP is kind of like a family and I couldn't handle leaving that I couldn't handle my school life changing too because I live in the West Hills and if I drop Japanese if I had left in the sixth grade which is when my mom said you're gonna do this until the sixth grade you're gonna stay in it until the sixth grade and after that it was my choice and I couldn't handle that so I stayed in it I still failed still failed but I stayed in it <laughs> and the next year I um, I started passing and things in my life kind of started slowing down and I was able to look back and I was able to reflect and why am I staying here I hate it it's it makes me so depressed and it, it stresses me out, but I've had so many good memories sliding into first grade from kindergarten on a slide with all your teachers and parents right there. Um, going to Japan in eighth grade, all the friends that I make, all the friends that I've lost. Um, wow, I'm gonna start crying. Um, <laughs> I've had so many good and bad memories and Japanese has <laughs> always been a part of my life since I was in kindergarten. It was the first thing that my mom put me in whenever we moved here. <laughs> and I had to make the choice to, um, for myself, for my sanity, for my mental health. Um, I knew that I would be missing out on opportunities like getting um, the, like passing a fluency thing whenever I graduate high school. Um, going to the Sapporo Summer Institute, I can't do that now. But I decided that, and I'm probably going to, I might regret it, I might not, I might decide, you know, later on, I might recognize the decision that I'm making now to depart from Japanese. Whew, tough stuff. <laughs> and um, I just want to say that I do not have to transfer schools. <laughs> and that's the end of my story, departing Japanese. Whew, sorry. Give it up for Alora. Yes, and a hug. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And I agree. I think having a Southern drawl did me. I mean, as I suddenly had this vision. I'm like, yes, that would make you the coolest six-year-old in Portland, having a Southern drawl. Absolutely. One more time for that very, very heartfelt story. Thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you. All right. Let's hear from the judges now on our penultimate story. There we go. You guys know what penultimate means? Yeah, I learned that about a year ago. <laughs> I was introducing uh, the final storyteller at the Moth as the penultimate storyteller because I thought it meant like even more ultimate than ultimate. <laughs> Finally, someone was like, hey, great show, but I gotta, <laughs> gotta help you out here with one of the definitions. All right, so our final storyteller, Sydney Jones, get on up here. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> this is surreal. Um, I never in my life believed I would ever do anything like this, and I'll explain in a sec. Um, you may know me as anonymous high school background character number three, uh, but what you might not know is that I am a professional escape artist. I would count myself among the greats of the 20th century. Harry Houdini, I'm talking really good. Have you ever been to a bad Thanksgiving? Your drunk uncle is crying in the corner 
and your cousin's about to fist fight your brother over a loan he gave him to start an upscale laundromat. When I was growing up, every single day of my life was a bad Thanksgiving. And you know how you feel uh, after a bad Thanksgiving. You're tired, you wish that you could reach to your relatives for help and love, but there's no peace, there's no safety. So when I th turned 13, I had to leave. I did two things in quick succession. I took about a half a bottle of sleeping pills and I cut a hole in my bedroom window screen with a thumbtack and I was out. Starting my career as a magician, I was going to escape or I was going to die. But I still survived and I lived the next five years of my life. I started high school. I lived with one relative or another. Sometimes I would start the year in one place and end it in, the net, in another. Um, unfortunately, the thing about bad Thanksgivings is no matter how long it takes you to recover from the dry turkey, uh, you still have to go back the next year, and that was what it was like. I experienced it again and again, and it never worked out. I slept in hospital beds and <laughs> home beds and on couches and on floors, and I escaped through front doors and back doors and the aforementioned window and a moving car and I was never steady and I was never stable and I didn't think I would make it this far. I didn't think I would graduate. I couldn't see myself going to college. I couldn't see myself living a life. Um, most recently, this past summer, I was in a group home. Um, it was for kids with mental disorders. After everything that's happened, I have post-traumatic stress disorder and depression and, and anxiety disorders and um, I was happy, but again, I was gonna have to leave. Uh, by no choice of my own, at the age of 18, um, they stopped providing services to you. So I set up to live an adult life. I knew I couldn't rely on my family anymore. So I signed up to go to a job corps way up in northern Washington, and I was going to learn a trade, and I was going to go on from there. And then uh, fate got me. Uh, the day I was supposed to leave, <laughs> uh, there was forecasted this monumental historic storm and I mean floods in the streets floods in your basement people in kayaks everywhere because Portland is like that um so I was terrified I had you know I was not ready to travel and I, I gave a call to my best friend Alejandro who is weird enough to talk to me in the first place so you know he's absolutely zany to offer a place for a teenage traumatized magician a few days until the weather improves but he did and I showed up with a trash bag at his house um, that day and it wasn't raining yet and it did not rain until uh, so we headed up the hill to Dew's teriyaki absolutely recommend it most delicious thing it's it's amazing okay it's incredible we're eating dinner and the sky is so ominous that I look out onto Sandy and the clouds match the color of the asphalt and it looks like the world is ends at the top of the hill and uh, it's still not raining until about 30 seconds after we walk out the front door to walk home and then it's raining and then it's pouring. I'll keep it short but I arrived uh, with about two inches of water in my boots and rain in places that have yet to see the sun. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, but I get about a block away and I look up and I feel safe. I realized I wasn't running for a second. I was loved. I was walking home and at that time I didn't expect it to last. I didn't expect anything to last. When you leave over and over again in your life, you, you can only see the departure when you look at any part of a relationship. But by fate, two things happened in the next week or so. One, I found out that leftover Dew's teriyaki chicken, even with about half a cup of Portland rainwater, is better than dry turkey at a bad Thanksgiving any day. <laughs> and then the second thing that happened, Alejandro's mom enrolled me back in school here at Grant almost without my permission. I <laughs> <laughs> didn't expect it to happen, and it did. And it was permanent. They want me. They want me to stay. 
And that was the first time I was ever sure of anything in my life. I was going to graduate. I'm going to go to college. So tonight, I would like to officially resign from my career as an escape artist. It's been a fun, and I've had lots of interesting experiences, but there'll be no need for that from here on. Thank you. And that is how you shut down a story slam, ladies and gentlemen. Give it up for Sydney. Woo! Yeah! Holy cow! Well done, and thank you for sharing that story with us. Thank you so much. And I, I have a friend who lives around here, and he swears by dues. And I've been there, and it's delicious. It's delicious. Juice. <laughs> Dues on the house, everyone, head on over. All right, let's see what the judges have in store for our final storyteller. There it is. This, this may just make things easy on the math wizards. All right, how about, how about we bring all the storytellers up on the stage for a huge round of applause. Get them on up here, guys. Woo! Let's, let's. A huge round of applause for the math wizards working their math magic. And a huge shout out to all our judges for judging and being here and supporting. And now let's bring Paige Battle to the stage. Let's give her a huge round of applause for organizing this and shepherding these stories. And she's going to announce our winner. Well, um, I have to say I am so incredibly grateful to all seven of these student storytellers because about a week and a half ago, I was just ready to depart from the idea of having a story slam, but they really came through and I'm really grateful. We chose the theme of departures because in about four months time, we will be departing this space and it's a little bittersweet. I'll, I was telling one of the judges when they came in, on one hand, I'm really looking forward to leaving behind the holes in the ceiling and the tear stains of rust that drip down. Um, but at the same time, there's been so many wonderful memories in this library and the story slam and poetry slams are definitely right in there in the top 10. So thank you guys for making the magic happen tonight. I'm so grateful. Um, okay, so um, our five or four storytellers that we want to give the first set of prizes to are Tayo. Thank you. David. Aiden. And Alara. Okay, so I did not see this one coming, people. We actually have a tie for the runner-up. And our runners-up tonight are... Sarah and Jamie. So, Pamela, we're going to have to figure how to work that one out. Um, so you guys hang tight. So that means that tonight's winner of our story slam, and I couldn't be prouder, is Sydney Jones. So... Pamela um, and Willie Levinson own Papina Swimwear. I highly recommend it. Mrs. Kokus and I swear by their swimwear. They have very graciously offered to give the winner and our runners-up gift cards to Papina. And so we're so grateful that they're supporting our Story Slam. Thank you so much. So thank you guys. Um, 
for coming out and hearing these stories. We'll do it again next year. We'll be out at Marshall, and we'll have to come up with some theme. But I hope to see you guys next February for our third annual Story Slam. Thanks for coming out.